now let's share screen. Do that. Excellent. And it is 3.02, so let's get started. As soon as I bring up my folder to see the saved stuff. And according to Awesome. So as we are doing every week, we are covering two chapters a week. Uh, but as I had said prior, if you just so happen to go ahead, it's totally fine. There is nothing holding you back from going two chapters at a time unless you want to. It is possible to complete this class uh, faster than, than how I'm going through it. Uh, but, you know, to be cognizant of your time, I'm going two chapters at a time. So today will be chapters five and six. Networks and storage. So first up will be networks. There are only two sub lessons. The first will be the standard switches. In order for our virtual machines to connect to talk to one another and to connect to the real world, we need a virtual switch. These things allow our virtual machines to not only connect with each other, but also do things like replication, to, uh, to manage fault tolerance, so on and so forth. The, a virtual switch is uuh, or functions in the same way as a regular switch, it is not a smart switch where you can connect to it and you would get a command prompt that you could you could configure it. Uh, it, it is more of a layer two type switch that doesn't have any uh, smart configurations in the traditional sense. It is very easy to create a switch uh, within networking, you would, or uh, within a host, for example, you would go to configure and under configure, you would add a new virtual switch and you could choose either a VM kernel network adapter or port group for a standard switch. One of the great things about virtual switches is, well, they're all software based, so they're not really real. Because they're not really real, it is possible to have many of them in your hosts. So for example, you could have one big virtual switch and it has all the ports for everything. So you have your management, which would get you to the, uh, the website to manage the center and everything else. You have vMotion, maybe you have a, a couple of production systems, a couple of testing, um, iSCSI if you have a iSCSI uh, server for your uh, storage and then the actual physical ports that connect out to the world. You could do that. That would make uh, networking pretty easy because all configuration would run through one switch. Or what you could do is have separate virtual switches for everything. In this sense, we could have one virtual switch that handles nothing but management traffic and it would go out certain physical ports, one for vSphere and against uh, vSphere vMotion and certain ports. Production will come out of one way, tests will come out of another way, iSCSI will come out another way. On this side of the switches where everything is virtual, the, this is all data flying back and forth. The switches determine where the, the communication goes and we'll kind of explain how it 
it functions in a couple of slides. But it is possible to have kind of like you have your, your physical rack with different switches, you can divide everything out virtually. A standard switch, like I said, can uh, allows our virtual machines to connect out to the world, whether it's to each other and out or both. So here's an example of VM1, who is connected to a switch all its own, connected to a physical card, a physical NIC, and out to the world. So in this, in this first setup, this virtual machine is connected all on its own to a virtual switch, who is then connected to a physical card and connects out to the real world. VM2 and 3 are connected to a second virtual switch, but they're only connected to each other. This means VM2 cannot get out to the world unless there are some routing rules in VM3 that allow VM2 traffic to go out through the virtual switch, up the VM, and out the door. Otherwise, VM2 will remain disconnected from the world. We have IP storage if we're uh, managing any uh, like iSCSI and our management network that controls everything. Again, because this is all virtual, we can do a lot with this. You can view some of the settings that we can edit in a, in a switch. And again, you don't have that many in a virtual switch, but you can. For example, uh, the port group, um, you can edit right here under edit. You see all the switches that are available. One cool thing about our virtual switches or V switches is they can all handle VLAN tagging. So you can have a virtual machine in your infrastructure connect to a real VLAN on your physical network. So it is completely possible to take, let's say, an accounting server on a, in an infra a company infrastructure, uh, turn that server virtual, set the end workstations into VLANs, and set the server into VLAN, and they'll all be able to talk to one another. V uh, VMware understands any VLAN tagging and we'll use it as such. Now, because we're going out through physical cards eventually, the bottleneck is not on the virtual NIC, on the virtual NIC or the virtual switch because that's all happening within the CPU. The bottleneck becomes the physical card. So if you have a card that is not fast enough to handle the traffic that's, that's coming out, that will be your bottleneck. This is why you want to ensure that your servers have the fastest cards that have a direct connection to the backbone of your entire infrastructure. Because in situations like this, where end devices are connecting into virtual machines, they need, they're going to need the fastest connection in. Now there are two types of virtual switches. There's the standard, which we've been talking about, and also the distributed. The difference between the two is a standard switch lives in a single host. A distributed switch can live throughout the entire data center. So with a virtual switch, with a standard virtual switch, I can take one ESXi host, and create the switch. It's gonna live in that host and that host only. If I have two ESXi servers and I create a standard switch on host A, it will not exist in host B. In a distributed switch, they'll be managed by vCenter and be available on all hosts. This last note right here, both switch types are elastic. Uh, it's they're elastic because they're software. Because the software doesn't have a physical limitation of how many ports exist in a switch. 
So a distributed switch. Again, managed by vCenter, they can span the entire data center, which is great if we have multiple applications or multiple uh, operating systems, uh, multiple virtual machines running on different hosts, and we want the same host to go out the same way, so quote, you know, the same way through the same switch, we will create a distributed switch. So it doesn't matter what physical host the VM is running on, it will go out through the same switch. This becomes important if we have VLANs. Then we need to make one distributed switch that that virtual machine will be able to talk through uh, through any host, any physical host. If this gets confusing, please uh, please say so in the chat. Either uh, Zoom chat, YouTube, or Discord. A uh, vCenter does give a distributed switch a little more power. For example, in a standard switch, we can't do things like inbound traffic shaping or NetFlow or port mirroring, but we can do all those things in a distributed switch. Now the policies. These are basically the settings of switches where we can define what they can do, what they can't do, how will they handle uh, certain traffic, how will they handle uh, nick teaming, and so on. As an admin, you can define some items like will the virtual switch or the group uh, forward traffic regardless of the destination. If you are running things like Suricata, Wireshark, TCP dump, uh, you know, um, Moloch, you would maybe want to enable promiscuous mode. If you need to change the MAC addresses, uh, you know, because they may get rejected, you can enter that there. You can also do forged transmits on, on any packets that come in and out. There are options to handle bursts because sometimes it, it like it, for example, at the beginning of a workday, there's going to be a much higher traffic than during the middle of the day when everybody is working. When everyone initially logs in, they're going to get their, those workstations are going to pull information from the server. So you're going to have a, a, a sudden burst and that burst won't stay, but you can define uh how much burst we want to give these virtual switches. And then this is all defined in traffic shaping. It's normally disabled, but you can enable it so that one or you know a couple of cards don't get overwhelmed. Because this is all virtual, we are able to define uh, NIC teaming and failover. So what happens when a NIC card dies or what happens when the cable that the NIC card is connected to is out or the physical switch is out? The virtual machines need to stay connected so we can define more uh, active adapters to add to this list so that if and when a NIC card dies, traffic just gets rerouted to the next NIC so that everything continues. Now this diagram may look a little crazy, but this is kind of how it's how it thinks. Uh, the virtual switches understand where traffic is coming from and are able to redirect that traffic back. So if the VM at the bottom of this diagram needs to connect out to this computer, and let's say this NIC, this physical NIC card is busy, well, the virtual switch is able to divert that traffic to a different network card and out the door into the real network and to its destination. 
same thing with our top VM over here. If this is the default way, the shortest way, and everything is good, it'll use that road. But just in, but if um, if a NIC card is busy or if the NIC card is disconnected, the virtual switch is able to determine where else, what other NIC card can we get traffic out so that it reaches the real world and is able to return back to the VM as needed. We can also do this by MAC address. So we can use a port, the virtual port ID. We can also use MAC address. We can also use IP hashes as well. These are all different ways that vCenter ensures that traffic leaves out through our virtual machines, reaches their destination, and is able to return. Now the VM kernel, part of the suite, uses things like beaconing in order to see when, when and if there is a network failure then it will either use any of the failover stuff that was set up earlier. Like uh, if NIC card A dies, then use NIC card B or uh, do any load balancing if it's been set up. Your physical network environment has to be considered uh, as you plan out your data center. Your whatever physical switches are directly connected to the servers that are running these virtual machines, you need to take quite a number of things in mind. For example, uh, how many switches do you have? The network bandwidth that you're going to need, depending on the number of virtual machines that will be connecting out to the world. Uh, will, will you use 802.3 AD for NIC teaming? If so, does the physical switch need to understand that? Uh, are you going to do VLAN tagging? If so, you're going to need a switch that understands 802.1Q. Uh, does the, the physical switch support LACP? Does it also support LLDP and CPD? Because these modes are also used by the, the V switches. and you'll have a lab to play with the standard switch. Any questions on a virtual switch, both the standard and the distributed? Okay. So I'll start making the video for that chapter. And then once that's done, we'll do chapter six. So this will take a few minutes.
Okay, now let's upload this video. Oops, that is not what I wanted. Select the file. Document, ah, uh, yes. Chapter five. And 174, not made for kids. Eighty percent uploaded. That'll be ready in just a couple more seconds. And then we'll do chapter six. Oh, okay. All right, so now we go here and we hit record. Excellent. So now chapter six, virtual storage. After this chapter, we'll be halfway through uh, the first set of the two, two major courses that we're doing. This one's all about storage. Data store is what VM use, VMware uses as the logical storage unit. This can be quite a number of things from their own format of uh, VMFS to NFS to vSAN and, and vSphere virtual volumes. All of our servers need to have a place to store these virtual machines, to call upon them, to, uh, to manipulate and manage them. That is where our storage comes into play. And this could be done in quite a number of ways. You could either directly attach uh, hard drives and format them into VMFS. You could use things like fiber, uh, fiber over ethernet, iSCSI, uh, you could connect a, uh, a NAS storage device. You could do vSAN or the vSphere virtual volumes. You have quite the number of ways to interconnect a storage, uh, either physical drives all the way up to storage servers uh, to use as storage for VMware. You have uh, uh, some capabilities. Of course, the, uh, the vSphere vMotion support made by them has the most capabilities. For example, it's the one that can connect on pretty much anything. VMFS is the format that you will see most commonly especially in small setups. Uh, this allows dynamic expansion of the, the drive, so quote. Uh, it can handle different block size. It can handle uh, quite a lot of movement between the files that live in the file system. So think of VMFS like NTFS or FAT32 or XFS or uh, APFS. It's, it's another file system or ButterFS. They all, they're all file systems and VMware has their own. You can also use NFS. If you have a NAS device like a Synology or uh, any other uh, products, you can connect those to VMware and provide storage for your infrastructure. vSAN is this very interesting concept that they made of taking uh, uh, SSDs and hard drives together to create this uh, vSAN data store, which we'll cover a little later. It's interesting. 
And then, whoops. And then there's also uh, virtual volumes that uh, are not necessarily um, LUNs like in other setups, but they, they can be complete systems that are acting as virtual volumes. Um, just as with a virtual machine running locally on your laptop or desktop, it is possible to map a physical drive as a virtual drive. It's not necessarily a good thing if we're talking um, in, a, in a much bigger data center infrastructure, it's better to join those physical hard drives together, but it is possible in case you need it like if you're doing forensics. Any, anything physical, just like with networking, you have to consider the physical limitations. Uh, how much data can come in and out? Do you, how much disk caching exists? Uh, any uh, possible issues with, with any other bottlenecks? You have to think about all these things as you figure out which storage method to use. Fiber is one of your many options. Uh, it could do ESXi can support up to 32 gigabits per second fiber channel or fiber channel over ethernet. If you so happen to have a fiber channel on your, on your backbone. So we have our disk arrays of uh, physical disks. They'll be connected to logical unit numbers or LUNs. Those will have their own storage processors connected through the physical uh, fiber out to the hosts, the hosts that will run the VMs. We're talking high speed interconnectivity, but we need it if we're dealing with critical systems and they need access to storage very fast. To address them, there are a number of ways that exist. Uh, so those ports would be like the WWN. Uh, you can define what zone, you know, if, we're, if we have many uh, disk arrays into various LUNs, we can divide that out. So we can have different VMs working off of different zones, which is great if we're managing our systems infrastructure wide. Multipathing also exists so that if and when, because it's not really an if, it's always a when, when hardware dies, we can have a failover so that our communications continue regardless that uh, switch A's port died or the entire switch collapsed. Especially with this level of infrastructure, we want to ensure that it's on all the time. Fiber channel over Ethernet has a little different setup. You can either do it software based or hardware based. Either way, you'll need the physical uh, fiber channel over ethernet switch to connect out to either the rest of the LAN where our workstations and endpoint devices will be or to a SAN if we so happen to have a SAN infrastructure in, in our data center. If we're gonna use software fiber channel over ethernet, you can make a, uh, a virtual switch to handle that and define a specific NIC card that will connect out to that physical switch. A note that if you're going this way, you can select up to four network adapters to use in this method. Once you have that physical or the virtual, sorry, switch set up, then you can go and configure it as a software uh, fiber over ethernet. You can do multi-pathing. 
you'll just need to define uh, which cards you're going to be using, defining their information, and inputting that into the uh, virtual switch settings. iSCSI is just another way of connecting our physical hard drives in a SAN or um, in a NAS out to our infrastructure. And just the same, those disks will be in LUNs. They'll have their own storage processors connected through a TCP IP network that'll connect out to our hosts, our ESXi hosts. iSCSI works a little different. You have a different target name than alias, but you'll have an IP address attached to them. That information will need to be added into ESXi or into vCenter in order for them to see it, uh, to, you know, to see these, these iSCSI devices. Now you have three ways of connecting iSCSI. It could be an independent hardware, it could be a dependent hardware or a software. All depending on what, what hardware do you have in your data center. Uh, setting it up, you'll need either the software or the hardware adapter, of course. You'll need to create a port that will be specific for iSCSI. This same port will work for any NAS or NFS storage. So the beginning steps will be uh, the same. Ideally, you want anything storage related to go out of its own card. You really don't want to mix the storage communication with like your management or your main network. Um, that's not a good idea, especially because uh, your storage communication is essential. I mean, can you imagine ripping out a hard drive while it's on on a computer? That's pretty much what you'd be doing if you have any network failure on your storage side. Um, so just like FCOE, there is the place for iSCSI. It'll find, it'll need to find the, uh, the connection and IP address of that iSCSI storage system. We could either by, uh, by static or dynamic, and it'll be entered into the list of targets. If you have a CHAP configuration for authentication, you can set that up. By default, it's off, but if your iSCSI device has CHAP authentication, you can enable that there. Just as with the others, you can do multi-pathing in case one NIC card dies and you need to get out, uh, you, you, know, you need to continue communication. It is possible to do so. A little deeper dive into VMFS, the file format or the file system that you'll see uh, installed in an EXXI system. It can handle volumes up to 64 terabytes of size. It is the default for everything VMware, as you can see in this long list here. When you attach a data store, like a physical drive, it'll get formatted into VMFS and you'll be able to see it on the side over here, uh, the format type that it's in. By going into the storage section and click it on the data store, you'll be able to see the files that exist. So every VM will have its own folder and within there will be all the files. This is your default configuration for VMFS. It is possible to overcommit storage. So be careful with that, especially as you're using thin provisioned VMs and you, you're using a lot of them. Keep that in mind. You can over allocate. You can increase 
the size of a VMFS data store by either adding more disks or adding another LUN to it. One big point is you can expand, but you can't shrink. So once you make, once you grow a VMFS data store, you can't go backwards. You can only go forwards. Uh, these are also able to be deleted or unmounted as needed. Just by right-clicking on that data store, you'll be see, you'll can see these options. Uh, these multi-pathing algorithms again come into play, especially because we're talking about infrastructure that people are going to depend on to be on all the time. So having uh, multipathing is essential at this stage. We can configure scalability and availability within the XSI to allow multipathing and saying, how do we want to get our, how do we want to keep our connections on? NFS which tends to show up in NAS systems, are also able to connect to ESXi and be used. You'll need at least version three or 4.1. It'll need the IP address, it'll need a folder where it's connected to and the host that'll be mounted. Again, you want to di uh, divide out any NFS network separate from other network like iSCSI. You'll be able to define what version we're connecting. And here you kind of see the, uh, the difference between the two. One key difference is with 4.1, it can't handle storage DRS and site recovery, but three does. When adding an NFS, like I said earlier, you'll give it a name. You'll you need to define what folder it will be mounted. Well, what folder we're using in the NFS system. Um, if we're using any authentication like Kerberos, you'll need to add that information in so that it can connect. Then you can define what uh, how you'll be connecting. Once it's available, you'll be able to see something like this. Here's my NFS data store that's already mounted. It's a 4.1, that's the URL to it. And as always, you can right click and unmount when needed. Just as with the others, we can define a multipath because we wanna keep our connection to our storage devices on up at all times. For NFS, you can use either uh, the cross stack uh, or the or not cross stack. You can kind of see your your recommended configurations for that. It is possible to do session trunking with NFS uh, four point one. So again, we have multi multi path. We can either connect to uh, 10.10 .10 or 10.20 to get to that NFS storage. vSAN, like I said, is an interesting concept, interesting implementation by VMware using multiple disks in an interesting array. So to do vSAN, we have our server. We need to have at least one NIC card. That's either one gigabyte or 10 gigabyte or gigabit, excuse me. We need to have a controller, either a SAS or SATA controller. We need to have an SSD and at least one other drive. One SSD will function as the cache. Everything else will function as the data. 
the idea being we have our data on the slower drives. Anything that uh, vSAN thinks is going to be used will be cached so that it gets out the door faster. To enable vSAN, there is an option uh, within uh, vCenter. Give it a name and say, yes, this is a, v a new cluster vSAN that we're making. Again, we'll have different disk groups together, one acting as our cache and the rest being our disks. And we can have up to seven per group. So there in the summary, we'll be able to see our vSAN cluster and how much space we're using. I know that picture is kind of blurry. This might be suitable for your needs. You might need, uh, because you have a lot of spinning disks, but you don't have the budget to buy or to replace them all with SSDs, but you have some, you could make this kind of of uh, SSD hybrid situation. Uh, so in those groups, you'll have your data store and those, those VMs will be able to be saved and moved across all these groups. As always, you can set up policies to manage how the clusters will work together. And here's where you can set up uh, those rules. Like uh, which type of storage is provided to the virtual machine, how virtual machines are placed within storage, and what services are offered to the VM itself. We can view the consumption of storage and make any edits as needed. That will be within the VM itself. So you, we can see in this Linux 01 VM, uh, it's using four gigabytes of, of disk storage on the data store. Uh, 1.3 uh, gigabytes up with eight coming back down. Any questions? I know that was kind of a lot. But it does cover the various ways that you can connect storage to your infrastructure whether that's either fiber channel, a vSAN, uh, NFS, iSCSI, or the native VMFS. Cool. If there are no other questions, then I will stop the stream and the recording.